colleagues. This is Mr. Trevor Nguani, who is a researcher in social change. And this is Dr. Karen Runciman, who is a postdoctoral fellow in social change. And I'm Professor Peter Alexander. I hold the South African Research Chair in Social Change, which is, and I'm supposed to say this on every occasion, uh, which is funded by the Department of Science and Technology, uh, administered by the National Research Foundation, and hosted by the University of uh, Johannesburg. And I'd like to thank those organisations for supporting us. And the research has also been backed by the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. As the researcher, also grateful to the research associates and research assistants who have been helping us over the years with this research, and some of them are standing around. But all of the data we will present and all of the opinions we will offer are our uh, responsibility. As you will see, uh, the research here is based upon extensive work which goes back to 2009. One of the reports you have in your pack was published at the end of that year, uh, and then there was an academic article published in a top journal, which came out in 2010. And that, argue, uh, that argues that the protests that we're dealing with are not merely service delivery protests, they're not just about service delivery, and we've referred to them over time as community protests, as have many other academics. They raise different issues, and... Uh, they raise issues which are not necessarily uh, about those that are specifically expressed by protesters, but reveal some of their frustrations, uh, unrest, uh, levels of injustice, and, and so on. And we'll, and we'll hear more about that later. These community protests, we argued, were part of a more general rebellion of the poor. If one looks at the individuals who are involved in these protests and the communities that are involved in these uh, protests, Overwhelmingly, they involve people who are marginalised um, and stigmatised often as, as the poor. So this is a rebellion of the poor that we are uh, concerned with uh, here. Um, we began uh, the development of a protest database in 2011, and that now has well over 2,000 entries, where we have recorded both the place and the date of the, of the protests. The following year, we started qualitative research which we've undertaken all over the country. Uh, and we now have, we think, about 250 interviews. I say we think because we're still analysing some of those interviews. And we're still continuing uh, with the qualitative research as well as with the quantitative uh, research. We've been analysing this data through the past year and continue to do so. Um, and uh, we now have what we think is the uh, most uh, extensive basis for understanding protests, community protests uh, in uh, South Africa. Um, we feel that there's been quite a substantial amount of poorly informed commentary about these protests, and that's why we've organised this media briefing today. We hope in our own small way to be able to inform some of the discussion on the basis of empirical data, and that's what you're going to be uh, hearing about. After the presentation, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask questions, and at the end of the briefing, we're available for interviews. But let me then immediately get the briefing underway. Uh, the first presenter is Karen Runciman, Dr. Karen Runciman, who will be reporting on the quantitative findings, and after that, we'll be hearing from Mr. Trevor Guani, and at the end, I'll make a few closing comments. much. I'll just start by giving you a, a description of how we collect our data. Um, we've drawn our data from four different media sources to try and overcome any um, biases that might be within any particular one source. So we draw our data from the SABC, from the South African Local Government Research Centre, from the database SA Media Online, which uh, catalogues 50 different English and Afrikaans medium press reports, all print media, and from Italy's way as well. So as you can see here, we start in 2004 and there's a general rise in trends and protests with peaks both in 2009 and 2012. 
We're still actually still finalising our data for 2013. This really only goes up until November. Um, so it is possible that we will record more protests in 2013 than we had in 2009. So looking at the peak of, of uh, 2012 with the 470 protests, of course you can clearly see that means there was at least one protest a day. Now of course it's likely the actual figure was much higher because we're depending upon media reports and obviously a number of protests will go unreported. So looking at the data, breaking it down month by month, you can see the months in which there have been uh, peak uh, uh, protests. Um, you can see in May 2012 that we had over 80 protests. A similar peak was observed in 2009 with just under 70. One of the key things to also notice here is that there is a tendency for protests to be clustered within the, the winter months, um, which is also important to think about in terms of when issues come up. But looking uh, more recently at what's been coming in the media uh, about the relation between protests and elections. So from our data, it seems that there is no clear relationship between protests happening prior to elections. And in fact, if you look at 2009, the election was the 22nd of April. And you can see actually the increase in protests happens after the election. And one of the things that we, especially in 2009, when we conducted our rapid response uh, research in, in Deep Slut and Petra Teeth, Balfour and Tecosa, was that uh, the reason for this upsurge after the election of Jacob Zuma was the sense that now that people had got their man into office, that they wanted to press their demands to the person that they felt was going to deliver. Now, of course, this was in 2009, and we all know how things have shifted since then. Looking at 2011, the election was the 18th of May, and again, it's kind of unclear to kind of see any direct relationship to protests happening uh, more often either before or after the election. What is interesting about 2011 was there was actually seven protests on election day, uh, and that is the only year where we actually are recording, so far anyway, protests happening on election day. Most of these were to do with service delivery, but also concerns with about who the, uh, who the candidate had been for a uh, councillor and the nomination process that happened in that time. So the majority of um, grievances cited by protesters are obviously service delivery. You can see this um, the bar closest to me here. Now the problem with the term service delivery is it masks the much wider concerns of people and it masks the relation between process and the crisis and post-apartheid democracy. Um, not only are people concerned about housing, water and sanitation, they're also concerned about the quality of democracy in South Africa, about who's representing them and how. Um, but it's also important to just point out, you can see an issue like unemployment actually features very low down and the kinds of grievances that we're recording within the database. Now that's where it's important to differentiate between the underlying causes of protest, which is unemployment, it is inequality, and the grievances that are being cited by protesters. So looking at the size of the protests, now I need to caution here to say most of the time in the media reports that we look at, we don't have an indication of the size of the protest. So unfortunately this is only based on the 20% or so of our data where we actually have information as to how many protesters were involved. So you can see that 44.9% were kind of what I guess we would call small to medium protests, so between 100 and under 500 protesters. But again there is a significant number of large protests between 1,000 and, uh, and just under 5,000 and some protests that have been over 5,000 as well. So that also gives an indication of how many people are getting involved in these protests. And of course one of the, the very prominent things that has been in the media and in many different discussions has been the question of violence and protests. The way we analyse and we think about violence is we make a distinction into three categories, peaceful, disruptive and violent. When we classify a protest as violent, we take a very strict definition which is drawn from international literature and is um, we, uh, taken as the benchmark in this kind of analysis. So violence is any instant, any protest where there's injured persons or property. So anything along those lines would be considered to be violent. 
We classify dis uh, disruptive protests really more things like your road barricades, your burning of tyres, where there's no other evidence of a damage to property. Um, and, it, and we're quite clear that we feel it's important to make that distinction because often um, the idea behind a protest is to disrupt the normal order of things. Um, it's clear from the research that we've been doing that it's largely the unemployed that have been involved in these protests and they're not like employed workers in those sections of the working class who can go on strike, who can raise demands that way. If you're unemployed, the only way that you can raise your demands is within your community. Uh, so that form of protest we think is important just to think about in terms of not necessarily always being violent. And of course we have peaceful protests which turn to be in marches you know, and delivering memorandums. But again also when we're thinking about violence and protests it's important to not just think of this as a one-sided relationship. There is the question of the action of police in um, sparking violence from protests and also certainly from the qualitative data which I think Trevor will speak more to. Uh, incidences of the arrogance of the councillor dismissing the way in which they speak to people, which incenses people. They've been struggling for a long time, and the person that's meant to represent them completely dismisses them, and things escalate from there. And of course, the other thing to think about in terms of violence is what we in the academic world call the structural violence. So it's the indignity of being hungry, of living in a shack, of living in a poor housing condition, of being unemployed and having a very insecure existence. So all of these factors together must be taken and thought about when we talk about protest violence. So I did mention the actions of the police and you have in your packs um, the numbers of people who have been killed by the police. So you can see here from our graph that there certainly seems to be a rising trend in the number of people who are being killed uh, by the police during, pro uh, during protests. This number does exclude the 37 killings at Maracana. Uh, and it's drawn from both our database and some online searches that we've been doing. So the total number of people that we can see that have been killed in protests since 2004 is 43 people. Uh, and I'll now hand over to my colleague who will explain a bit more about the violence from the positive side of the data. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much. <coughs> um, I'll speak a bit about the qualitative data, which involves going to an area, spending a week, conducting some interviews, <coughs> getting the inside story as it were. Uh, we all know that statistics tell a story, but not the whole story. So, for example, it says that um, in uh, 2011, <coughs> nine people were killed by police, but among one of the people who died was Andre Statan. Okay, it was just one other death, but it got so much publicity that it gave a picture of what is actually going on. Also in 2004, uh, a young man called Debu Mkonza died in Intabazo. He was 17 years old. So it's important to zoom in and find out the story as it were behind statistics. So as uh, Peter was saying, We've conducted about 250 interviews in all the provinces to try and get, you know, deeper. For example, why are people protesting? Questions of motivation, historical, social, economic, and political processes. <coughs> well, one of the themes uh, which uh, my colleague has just mentioned, Karen, is what I can call the limitations of our democracy. So there's a lot of unfulfilled promises, dashed hopes, uh, unmet expectations. Uh, we know that youth unemployment is about 70%, and this is very frustrating. And perhaps it's not surprising that most of the protesters are young, unemployed people. Uh, of course, uh, conspicuous consumption by those who have more doesn't help. There's a joke in the township that when our president wants to build himself a house, he builds a town, a suburb. So, you know, people feel that there is money uh, to address their needs. And indeed, in one of the interviews, a, a protest leader in Pumalanga, you know, in Pumalanga, there's this problem with water. He said, in truth, it's not just about water. This place, there is no development, no jobs, no hope, nothing. So, you know, the protest issues also reflect 
you know, problems with uh, our democracy. Uh, another point I want to make, uh, point two there, uh, is that often peaceful means of protesting are exhausted before people get, you know, disruptive or even violent. Uh, people will go and attend the mayor's in Bizo, which is a gathering where you are allowed to put your grievances across. They will participate in the IDP process. This is a process whereby you can tell the local council your needs and influence the budget. There is even, you know, the president's hotline. And these days, people also resort to the public protector because they feel that, you know, Tulima uh, Donzela is doing something. So, indeed, when people start hitting the streets, I think, you know, they should have a banner saying, all protocol observed, because they've gone through all the, uh, the, the channels. And then also, uh, also there is a problem whereby it's not easy for um, communities to engage in peaceful protest. Because remember, according to the law, if you want to have a march, a peaceful march, a legal march, we have to apply from the municipality. And usually it's the municipality with which you have a gripe. So often the municipality will frustrate you and not grant you permission to march. So in a way, one could even say that in South Africa, it is easier to, be, to have a disruptive protest than a, a legal order one. And then uh, I think Karin touched a bit on government unresponsiveness, where people will march, hand over their memorandum. There is a legal process which is called a petitions pro protocol, whereby you know the council must send people to the community, have meetings with you. But most municipalities just ignore that. So they ignore you know, the petitions and memoranda that people submit. And then people feel that the only way to be heard is to you know, bend some tires and get attention. Of course, sometimes uh, you know, uh, government authorities actually are provocative. As you all know, the premier of Gauteng told the people of Pakistan, we don't need your dirty votes. And this is a real issue now in Pakistan because they feel that they can't use the vote to change things. What else remains for them to use? So this takes me to a point about what is there for people to push forward their demands, what I can call means of protest. A worker can go on strike, but an unemployed youth in an informal settlement hasn't got much going for him or herself to make her points. Hence, banning of tires, doi doi, and sometimes, you know, uh, violent protest. And then, of course, uh, there is this big issue of people, communities, banning their own uh, facilities, banning libraries, uh, damaging, uh, I don't know, the clinic, and so on and so forth, which, I mean, everyone can see it's not a good thing, it's wrong. But when you do research and talk to communities, you find that, firstly, when people when they're oppressed, when they're exploited, want something, often they are prepared to lose something in order to get what they want. So there's an element of sacrifice. So they know that our clinic is going down, but they feel that they might get more attention, a better response by engaging in such uh, behavior. They'll tell you Mandela spent 27 years in jail. He sacrificed his freedom. He sacrificed life with his family. Why? So that we could get, you know, win the bigger cause. We all know that hunger strikers, you know, they sacrifice their bodies. So in a way, it is desperate people crying out, appealing to be heard, which leads to some of these, uh, you know, um, actions uh, of vandalism. And then lastly, uh, often the police will provoke violence because people will be protesting um, you know, peacefully or burning tires. Burning tires is not, is not necessarily violent. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a mechanism. It's like the smoke which calls the mayor to come that something is wrong here. 
and then uh, you find that people want water and then the police come what they bring is a water cannon and that actually can get people uh, fighting so um, my last point uh, is about the agency of protesters the fact that the protesters like you and me are also the custodians of democracy they are also the intended beneficiaries of democracy that have as much right to what they demand as all of us so uh, here is uh, two quotations which give you a bit of a sense of the kind of things people say when you interview them we have not had a strike this year apart from this one what we wanted the most is that they keep neglecting us after the protest we would protest again and the next one will not be as peaceful we would vandalize everything this is what we planned it would be useless for us to protest peacefully and then they still neglect us in fact the strike has not ended it can start at any time so it means you know people have marched and then they are neglected ignored so they feel they must take sterner action you know what our aim is not to destroy our aim is to have our voice to be heard we as a community we want escom even when we protest we do not want to, to destroy but the police are intimidating us that's where the problem starts you know what i can say is that our aim is to have a peaceful protest so i think it conveys that sense of people really just want to be heard so unlike for example the mine workers you know they are on strike demanding a living wage uh, NUMSA is going to pull out of Kosach because they feel people, you know, workers are not benefiting. I think that university students, you know, they want uh, funds. I think ordinary people in informal settlements demanding water, demanding houses, I think there is much, they've got as much right to democracy as you and me. Thank you very much. Um, let me make just a few closing comments. The first of these, Let me just make a few closing comments. The first of these, these is that we need to place South Africa within an international context. And the academic literature here shows increasing levels of protest around the world since 2007. And the implication there is that there's an underlying economic factor which is contributing to the protests that we see elsewhere in the world, but also in South Africa. And it's worth us considering the way in which some of these larger protests grow up without any real warning whatsoever. I was in the Ukraine last year in November, and four days later, the mass protests uh, began. And in the Ukraine, I've been talking to the key academics who have been researching protests there, uh, and I was interviewing a number of uh, leading activists from uh, different uh, political organizations and none of them were aware at all of the protest which was about to emerge in, in the Ukraine. And one can find similar examples from other countries. So we shouldn't be surprised if in South Africa uh, these protests come up very quickly without any warning whatsoever. I'm not suggesting that in South Africa we're about to see protests of the Ukrainian kind or the Cairo kind, uh, but we shouldn't be surprised if at some point in the future this does begin to occur. Now, we and indeed other analysts have been reporting on the rising levels of protests uh, since, at least in our case, 2009. Uh, and that's contained a warning to us in South Africa, a warning uh, that unless the underlying problems that poor people face are addressed, then these protests are going to continue to happen. So there shouldn't be any surprise whatsoever about the protests that we've seen and had reported over the period of the, of, of the last month. Indeed, I remember one trade union uh, leader um, talking about a ticking time bomb some time ago. And that's what we've had. It's been a ticking time bomb uh, in South Africa. And uh, these protests are going to uh, continue. Continue, that is. And let me just finish with a few comments on what is to be done. Continue, that is, unless there is uh, a shift in, in the way in which the authorities um, 
operate. They must listen sympathetically and act positively, not bureaucratically. Um, and um, they must concern themselves uh, with the reasons for the actions that people are taking and avoid making promises that will not be fulfilled. In a number of the qualitative interviews, uh, people have concerned themselves in what they've said to us with the way in which they have expectations of change, not just na necessarily at a national political level, often at a very local level, they have expectations of change which are then unfulfilled. So that's an important factor. We don't think that bureaucratic responses, um, uh, public uh, participation processes, uh, the involvement of board councillors supposedly in reporting back are working. Uh, so there needs to be new ways in which the politicians listen to people, particularly when people are involving themselves uh, in protests. The second point that I want to make in relation to what needs to be done is that repression won't work. It will not address the underlying problems and will intensify bitterness and alienation. And I think that's becoming increasingly clear to us. The police can attack protests, they can kill people, but that doesn't stop those protests. And on a larger scale, it's not going to be stopping the kind of rebellion that we've been describing over a number of years. So repression won't work, it's not the answer. And our view is that we need thoroughgoing economic and institutional reform. The kind of economic reform that will only occur if the government intervenes. And when we talk about intervention, we are not uh, limiting ourselves to uh, implementing the NDP, which I see is the proposal of the President's political advisor in one of the newspapers uh, today. Uh, the government has been our government for 20 years, and when people are protesting now, they are protesting uh, with the context uh, of uh, unfulfilled promises from the government. So what we are talking about is something much more substantial uh, than the NDP if we are to effectively address the problems uh, that concern people in South Africa, and we need institutional form, reform at the level of cultural change, particularly uh, at a local level, but national levels as well. So let me end then uh, with um, a summary of the arguments that we've been making. Firstly, there's been an upward trend in community protests with a peak in 2012. Secondly, there is no clear relationship between elections and protests. Thirdly, community protests are not about service delivery, but also not just about service delivery, but also raise concerns about the quality of post-apartheid democracy. Fourthly, there has been an increase in the number of violent and disrupt disruptive protests uh, since 2009, um, and uh, violent and disruptive protests are the culmination of a long process of formal claim-making point uh, made by Mr Nguani. Uh, and then we've mentioned this very large number of protesters who have been killed by the police uh, since uh, 2004, a total of 43. And that doesn't include the 37 who were killed at Maracana. And finally, our view is that fundamental economic and institutional change is needed, not repression.